We are at the Last Supper, John 13 through 17, is where we are now. John, the 13th chapter. And he records seven, truly, truly, I say unto you, messianic doctrines at the Last Supper. And these are very important. At the very top of your uh, paper, if you, if you have one, I've listed them all in chapter 13, 14, and 16. There are seven. We are now looking at the 13th chapter, verse 38. So if you have your Bibles, let's start with verse 31. You'll notice under point one that what I've done is I've taken verses 31 through 38 on the subject of the second betrayer. We have already seen at the Last Supper, the first betrayer was revealed. Uh, that was Judas Iscariot. And now a second one is going to be revealed uh, in verses 31 through 38. So what I did under point one, I broke my passage down into four sections, verses 31 through 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. Well, I guess there's five in there. One, two, three, four, five, and then verse 38, okay? So when we go through those, uh, pay attention to the way at least I looked at this subject matter in order to preach this doctrine today. Uh, when therefore he had gone out, that's Judas's carrot. Now remember, last week when we closed out, if you, if you uh, look back into verses 21 through 30, you will see that at the very, very, at this very point is um, in the Somayan ceremony, the sopping of the bread and giving it to Judas by Jesus, uh, Satan indwelt him. Satan, not a demon, Satan, okay? Uh, Satan indwelt him. And, and he is left now to go out and, you know, this is the eve of the crucifixion. And he's gone to finish the deal so that when Jesus gets at Gethsemane, he's going to come out and do the famous betrayer kiss and Jesus will be arrested and crucified. That's where we are. When it says, when therefore he had gone out, it's a reference to Judas and dwelt by Satan. Uh, Jesus said to the rest of the disciples, we now have 11. Now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If, that's a first-class condition in the Greek language. That means if and it's true. If and it's true. If God is glorified in him, and he will be, God will also glorify him in himself. I can't begin to tell you how important theology is right here. The theology that's given here for the church is enormous. I'm going to read that again because you didn't get it, okay? And listen, and that's okay because it takes several readings of this for it to click what he just said. This is a relationship between God the Father and God the Son that's going to be established when Jesus Christ goes and dies on a cross for the sins of the world. That's why he was sent, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. He's going to be buried on the third day raised from the dead. He's going to be in 40 days of post-resurrection appearances to his disciples. And he's going to ascend back to the Father into the third heaven and be seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. All of that is what it, all of that details of working out the plan of God in the life of Jesus Christ is what he's talking about right here. And not only that, but seated at the right hand of God the Father, when that seating position is done, that session, seated in session, when that session period is over, the end of human history will come, and Jesus Christ will give back all the authority that the Father gave him. He'll give it all back to the Father. <clears throat> That's what this is just saying. <clears throat> That's exactly what that's saying. 
the theology of this statement in this verse is just lights out. So I'm going to read it again. <clears throat> now, now, Judas has gone to betray Christ, and now everything is in high motion. The betrayal, the arrest, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, now it's in high motion to be completed. This is the word now. When therefore Judas had gone out and set this whole thing now in motion, the motion of the arrest, the crucifixion, the, re the re burial, the resurrection, ascension, session, all of that now is in, is in high speed motion. Now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him if, and God will be glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself. In other words, in eternity past, at the, at the eternal life conference, this was a high established position. This was already there. Time came for Christ to come into the world called the incarnation. And then everything got into high motion in human history. Now we're at light speed in fulfilling this stuff. And now it will track out. It will track out on the other side into the session of Jesus Christ when he comes back and then the tribulation, the millennium, and all of that is going to transpire. And in the end is what we're, we're, what we're talking about. And it's talking about the glorification. We're talking about the glorification of Jesus Christ. When he is glorified, the Father is glorified in him. And that will take him to the end where it will all go back to the way it was in the original beginning. That's pretty powerful stuff. I just gave you a whole lot of information in a very small capsule. Then in verse 33, little children, he uses the word technon in the Greek language. He uses the word technon. And this is a reference to little children who are, these are, this means that these are our grown adults who uh, have enough doctrine in their souls to be mature, teleos, and are not. By the decisions that they're making and by, they have enough doctrine to, to be an adult, but they're an adult acting immature. This is a word that is, when it's spoken to adults, is immature. For example, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I acted like a child. But now that I'm a grown person, I shouldn't be doing that anymore. Right? That's the word. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You shall seek me. And as I said to the Jews, I now say to you also, where I am going, you cannot come. Now he's going to give an enormous doctrine again. A new covenant I give you. A new covenant. This is the whole church. The whole church age is new covenant. The church age. The church age is the new covenant that's going to go into the millennium, new covenant idea. We are new covenant people. We are not old covenant people. We are new covenant people. We are the people of grace, not law. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. As I said to the Jews, I now say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you. That you, and here it is. Here is the key doctrine of the new covenant. The key doctrine of the new covenant. Now, how do, how do you know you're under a new covenant? Every time you take part in the Lord's Supper. Every time you take part in the Eucharist. You know what? It's the blood of the cup of the. It is the blood of the cup of the new covenant. I don't know how often you take the Eucharist. We do it every month around here. But every time you're reminded that you are believers in the new covenant. 
Not as the world understands it, but as God, as God decrees it. Agape love. Agape love. Agape love. A new commandment I give to you that you love who? One another. That's one of the same kind. That's Christians ought to be loving Christians. And you know why you should love them? Because we're both in Christ. So often we don't love other Christians in Christ. We love them in the world. By that I mean, when you look at another Christian, your love is not dictated by his behavior. Your love is dictated by your position in Christ. We spend way too much time not loving one another because we love each other based on each other's character and not our position in Christ. We should love others as we've been loved. We should forgive others as we've been forgiven. I'm just saying. This is what this is teaching. A new covenant. A new covenant I give you that you love one another even as I loved you. That you also love one another. Watch this now. This is why the world is not attracted to the church. Here it is. It's not because it's not good teaching. It's not because it don't have heat and air conditioning and all the stuff that makes your life comfortable when you come to church. Uh-uh. It's not the big neon sign out there. It's not the charismatic pastor in the pulpit. No, you know what it is? Listen what he says. New covenant. The key doctrine is love one another. One another. Those of you that belong to the church and love one another, not based on their character, social condition, race, anything else. You're to love as you've been loved. Now watch what he says. By this. By this. By what? By this, right? He's told you what the by this is. By this, some men, right? Does your Bible say some? Well, then that don't exclude you. Does it say all? Yes. My Bible says all. Does your Bible say all? Okay. Just in case you think that somehow somebody's offended you enough that you don't have to love them. Because you can find three people that agree with you. That what they did is offensive. How are you to love the other person? The other person being the other Christian, how are you to love them? As Christ loved you. By this all men, by this all men, that is the world, men of the world, all men, unbelievers, when they witness the church loving one another in spite of their character. Forgiving as forgiven, loving as loved. At peace with one another because of our position in Christ. By this, all men will know that you are disciples of Christ. It's not how much you do. It's not whether you sing in the choir. It's not whether you teach. It's not how much money you give. You know what it's based on? How you love. It's based on love. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. What an enormous doctrine was just taught. Listen to what Peter says. Peter says, well, Lord, then teach me how to love, right? I need to know this subject. Then teach me how to love. If, if I'm going to a new covenant, if, if, if this is the love, oh, I don't know that I have a grasp on this. Then 
Explain that to me, Lord. Is that what he said? Is that what he said? No, you know why? Because he wasn't paying attention any more than you are. He was not paying attention. It was going in one ear and out the other. That's what happens when you sit in church and don't pay attention. It goes, what? they're at church. They're, it, Listen what, he's, listen what he wants to know. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Where, where are you going? That goes way back to verse 33. He said, I'm going to give you a new, a new commandment. And everybody goes like, big deal. Are you kidding me? A new commandment? A new sheriff has showed up. Somebody that can give a commandment, a new. Somebody, the Hebrew writer says, somebody greater than Moses has shown up. I give you a new commandment. Nobody wrote it down. Nobody cares. Where are you going? Can I go? So much for Bible study. Where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I not follow you now? Is that not a, is that not a little kid? Where are you going, Daddy? Mm. Can I go? Let me go too. I'm going to the bathroom. Do you mind? I don't mind. Can I sit by the door? Now, you mamas know what I'm talking about. You mamas know. We dads don't. But I guarantee every mama in this whole building understands that. I don't know how many times Angie, I said, what kind of a day are you having, Angie, if I could just go to the bathroom alone? <laughs> I mean, that would be a complete day for her. Victory, victory in Jesus. I want to go, Daddy. I'll lay my life down for you. Oh, really? Will you lay your life down for me? True, here's our truly, truly. Truly, truly, I say to you, a cock shall crow, shall not crow until you deny me three times. That's our second betrayer. Here is a truly, truly that identifies the second betrayer sitting at the, at the uh, Last Supper. Boy, the way, they're, the way these, got, the way these are, are, are dropping, we won't have any disciples at the, at the time this thing's over, right? Right. They're going to drop like flies. There won't be anybody to play in the fourth quarter. When the fourth quarter comes, there will be nobody. Well, let's take a look. In verses 31, 32, going to be glorified. I want you to write two passages down. I, I didn't write for you because this is great theology. And here's the theology written in other places of the scriptures as dynamite. And here are these two little verses that we don't understand, therefore we just blow by them to get to something we do understand. Listen, many times you need to stop when you're hearing something you don't understand, write it down to figure it out because the Holy Spirit will teach it to you. Just don't pass it over, you know. We're so familiar with going to a word, we don't know what it means, so we just skip over it like it's not important. But the word might have been penicillin. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> some words we just shouldn't skip over. Uh, glory to be glorified, the son of man. And so there's a chain reaction that goes out through human history. It's now started. It's on fast speed. And it's going to, it's now on fast speed. Christ is going to be betrayed. He's going to be crucified, buried, raised, ascension, session, and session is, and he looks all the way to the end. <clears throat> all the way to the end. Write this down. Here's the end. Paul writes about the end. 
Here's the end. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 25 through 28. There's the end. You read that, you'll understand this. Here are the other two passages. Uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. That's an enormous passage. And Hebrews 2, 9 through 11. Hebrews 2, 9 through 11. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. These are, these are dynamite. These are the, if you want to know what, what does all of this mean theologically, it's heavy theology. In verse 33, going away alone, there's going to be a presence with me, an absence, and then a presence. I'm present with you now. I'm going to be absent, and you can't follow. And then I'm going to be back present with you. You know how, what that is? Resurrection. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm, I'm with you now, but I'm going to die on a cross. They're going to bury me. And three days later, I'm going to come out of the grave, and I'm going to be back with you. That's what he's telling them. They're not understanding it. And when they do understand it, they want to know where you go. And I want to go too, Daddy. In verses 34 and 35, he gives them a new commandment. We are now, and it's kainos. The word new is kainos. And we're meaning that we're going to change from old to new. There's going to be a change from the old to the new. Paleosity over to kainos. We're going to, there's going to be a change from the old covenant to the new covenant. The book of Hebrews, uh, the first 10 chapters deal with this. Hebrews, first 10 chapters. And of course, what is the, what is the key doctrine? Of course, the key doctrine is agape love. Now listen, agape love is like no love you've ever known. It is the love that God has it is the love of God that sent his son to die. John 3, 16. You want to know what love is in extreme? It is the father setting the son to die. Son to die. And for us to get the benefit of that death, all that's required of us is to believe. And when we believe, we are exchanged from perishing to eternal life. You talk about a good deal. <laughs> that beats Black Friday. That beats Black Friday. But here's what people miss. They miss understanding what, the, what, what is demanded of you in agape love. So write this down. Write this down. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and verse 13. Here's the command to love one another as I loved you. But you don't know what that means. I mean, how do I know when, how do I know what this love is? He tells you, he tells you in words you can understand. He gives you the description in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and then verse 13. He gives it to you in living dramatic life. And if you want to know what this love is that, that we're told that when you have this kind of love, the world sees it, and they want what you have. The world knows that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. You don't have to walk around with a T-shirt that says, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. They don't know you're a disciple because you have a T-shirt. They'll know you're a disciple when you can love the way God loves. That's supernatural. That takes the power of the Holy Spirit, and that takes an awareness of what kind of love are you talking about? Is it a love like I love my dog? Is it a love like I love my car? Is it a love like I love my life? What kind of love is this? The answer is found in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and verse 13. It amazes me that no, no, few of you wrote it. Just a few of you. I tell you, you're smarter than Jesus. I know you're smarter than me, and you know that. That's why you didn't write it down. 
Listen, unless you know all those things that are identified in there, you don't understand agape love. Oh, you got the word love, but you don't know how it measures out in your life. Oh, God loves me and I love God. Yeah, how about other people? And how about those who don't do you right? How about those who stab you in the back? How about those that hang you on a cross? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Verse 36 and 37, we've got Peter discussing how he will give his life for Christ. He's got moral courage. Jesus Christ is not looking for moral courage. He's looking for faith courage. He's looking for people who will fight the good fight of faith. Not the people who will talk the battle, but those who will walk the battle. Not people who will talk the war, but those who can win it. You know, young David, I mean, I mean, just young David, he goes out and faces Goliath. Before he faces Goliath, he faces King Saul. And you see the contrast in the talk, in the walk. When he meets with King Saul, King Saul talks warfare to him. Oh, son, you've got to have this, and you've got to have that, and you've got to be careful about this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. He talked it and couldn't walk it. Every time Goliath came out, all of Israel plus the king, they went, they went bunkers. They cowed down. They sweat up a storm. Oh, oh, oh. He, they could talk warfare. They couldn't walk it. No faith. No faith. David walks out and says, I don't need to know about warfare. I need to know how to win the battle. The battle is the Lord's. The fight is mine. Therefore, that's a done deal. It's just a matter between leaving the tent and going to meet Goliath, how God's going to do this. And on the way, God says, pick up a stone. Oh, by the way, pick up five in case his brothers don't get the hit. If they're hard-headed, we'll solve that. Listen, what God is looking for is the courage of faith, not moral courage. He's looking from Christians. He's not looking for moral courage. Do you know what's interesting? When they left, the, when they left to go to Gethsemane, do you know what the, you know what some of the they packed two swords? Did you know that? Oh, if you read the story, you will. That'd be too much trouble, maybe. But if you read the story, you would know. They packed two swords. Only one was used. But the man who had moral courage pulled his sword and cut off uh, the high priest's servant's ear. So Jesus had to do a little cosmetic surgery there. Miraculous. <laughs> There it went, and we were done. Nobody even wants to talk about that miracle. Oh, feeding the 5,000, that's a big deal. Peter cutting the high priest's ear off. It, Jesus could have gotten nervous and planted that thing anywhere. <laughs> there, there it had been. I'm going to tell you point number two. You need to read the synoptic of the Gospels. All four Gospels talk about the second betrayer and how he was revealed at the Last Supper. And they all give you a, a wonderful view, a little a different spin. For example, Matthew 26, 31 through 40, and Mark 14, 27 through 31, they both quote that the fulfillment of Zechariah 13, 7. And that's about the shepherd being slain and the sheep being scattered. They're interesting how they all work out of this. Mark is interesting because Mark records that the rooster crows twice before Peter denies three times. He's the only writer that does that, by the way. Luke, in his account of the same story, in Luke 22, 31 through 34, he tells us something interesting about Simon Peter. 
He said that Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Boy, Satan is a busy guy with the disciples, isn't he, on this day? Behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Now, if you want to know what that permission and sifting would be like, you read the book of Job. But I've prayed for you. Don't you love this? Listen, there may be a lot of people in this world never pray for the one upstairs at will. Do you love that? You never down, man. You always got one on your team, always on his knees, always caring for you. Here's what he says. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Peter, you're going to fail. Satan has, has got permission on you. Here's what I'm going to pray. And listen, here's, here's for all of us. Here's, here's where we are. Here's where we are. Watch this. I will pray for you that your faith may not fail. He didn't say moral courage. He said his faith courage. You know where faith comes from? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. I'm going to pray for you that your faith may not fail. You know, people bring us, listen to me, now I'm going to give you a little secret here about prayer. People always come and have, have listen, they know we pray, don't, don't you? And people come to you and say, I got a prayer request, right? That's a wonderful thing. You know why? They see you're a disciple of Christ, that you have evidence in your life of some of the love that they need from you. And they'll bring a prayer request to you and say, I need to have you pray for me. With you? Are you with me? You know, you, you know the first prayer you should pray with them while they're there? You should say, let me have a prayer. Of course I will. Give me your prayer request. And before they leave, you should say, you should say this. I want to have a word of prayer with you. The first part of that prayer should be, Father, that their faith may not fail. And then the second part of that should be for what they've asked. You know how it was important? He said, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that your faith fail not. What kind of a test is, is Satan going to give him? When he sifts him like wheat, what is he sifting like wheat in his life? Faith. The exercise of faith. Not that I, I know the word of God, but that I will execute the word of God as designed. That I will apply what I've learned, I will apply to my life. And that is the exercise of faith. That's we call it faith cycle here. Faith, faith, that your faith may not fail. And you, once you have tur turned again, you will strengthen your brothers. That's pretty powerful. It is in Luke 22, verse 38, that we find two swords in case you're interested. Let me look at point three. To show you how sometimes people can get so distracted about nothing. Many Bible students are troubled by Mark's account of a rooster crowing twice before, before uh, Peter denies him three times. Crowing twice. Everyone else, Matthew, Luke, John, all the rest of the writers record, do not record the rooster crowing twice. But I'll tell you what they all do record, and that's of interest. They all record that the rooster that Peter heard was in his third denial. When he denied Jesus the third time, he heard the rooster crow. I don't know how many times the rooster crowed before then. It doesn't really matter to the rest of the writers it doesn't really matter to Peter that he missed the first crow, the crowing. But I'll tell you what did get him was that he heard the rooster crow at the time he made his third denial. And there was a recall in his soul. A recall. So I want to talk about this real quick before I have to close this down. Tony's got the second session. 
Everyone, all four riders agree that the last crowing of the rooster was the one that caught, caught Peter, Peter's attention with his third denial. The crowing is where I want to focus on the next five points. Because listen to me, the conscience of the human soul. I want you to get this down. And so I wrote it down in detail. The conscience of the human soul. The human soul has self-consciousness, conscience, mentality, volition, and emotion. That is the makeup of the human soul according to the Bible. We're talking about the conscience and the mentality in this story. The conscience and the mentality and the right lobe. Mentality has two lobes. It has a left lobe and a right lobe. One is, we're familiar with all that. But here, here let me show you this. Let me show you this. When the rooster crows in his third denial and, and Peter hears it, guilt and remorse. The Bible says that Peter wept how? Bitterly. For somebody to weep bitterly, the conscience and the mind has to overflow. They have to flood. There's a flooding in it. Guilt, extreme guilt and emotions. As the mind recalls what Jesus said, as well as what Peter did without even moral courage. His conscience is overflowed, overflowed with guilt. A lack of moral courage, and he boasted, and he had his sword and did all that. The shame and all the stuff that goes with that. The rooster crowing at Peter's third denial brought guilt and recall of the fourth truly, truly doctrine of verse 38. Matthew 26, 75 says he wept bitterly. The right lobe of his mentality recalls what Jesus had told him. When it does, it recalls that he has been sifted like wheat by Satan. He's been the play tool. He's been the playboy of Satan. And his soul is overflowed. Peter's third denial fulfilled the first advent section of Zechariah 13, 7. It goes on to talk about a second coming as well. But remember, in the Old Testament, you didn't have separation of first and second coming until the church. What is interesting about the sheep is that the sheep are including, when Zechariah is quoted, it includes all of the disciples and all of the followers of Christ. The word sheep is the flock that has been following Christ. We'll all scatter. You talk about being lone. That's Zechariah 13, 7. Listen to me. The sound of the roosters crowing would be the sign of Peter's denials and to the other sheep of their scattering at the death of their shepherd. Now I'm going to tell you, years from then, when they heard a rooster crow, a bell went off. That's the way the conscience works. My grandfather used to tell me as a young boy that you could set your clock on two things. A rooster's crowing, being a farm boy, a rooster's crowing in the AM and a railroad train. You know, the railroad watch. It is interesting to me how Jesus has used birds on day five creation to teach many Bible lessons like Matthew 6. How Peter deals with the long-term effects of the sound of a rooster crowing about his conscience is going to be important to his spiritual growth. 
Because every morning, you're going to get up to a rooster crowing in Israel. Every morning of your life. Happy and, and trauma experiences in life have long-term effects on the conscience and memory. This is one of the areas of importance of cycling Bible doctrine to erase that stuff. To erase it. Get it off. You take it in. You apply it. You say, this is how I'm going to establish my life. I used to be fearful. I'm not going to be fearful because I have faith. I used to think this way, but I'm not going to think that way anymore. I'm going to put that off, and I'm going to put what Christ says I should be thinking on. I'm going to put off my old way of thinking. I'm going to put on my new way of thinking in the Word of God. That's what we're talking about here. Hebrews chapters 12, 1 and 2, you want a healthy soul? This is how you have a healthy soul. You think you're long gone, and rooster crows, and you go like, oh, shoot a rooter. I'm just, I was a bad one. What, what are you doing? Does a rooster upset you that much? Yeah, oh, just kill a rooster. I can't take it. The rooster going, what you doing with me, man? They put me down. Now I got to kill you, man. It bothers him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't you imagine every morning where Peter heard a rooster crow? It brought flashbacks of guilt with his experience of extreme weeping because of the failure of his denials of Christ. But let me tell you, Bible doctrine is a new way of thinking. And Bible doctrine is a building blocks, not only to establish you as a new person in Christ, but to get rid of the old person that's got a lot of misery and baggage. A lot of baggage. Rooster crows and you go nuts. At some point, Peter's got to be able to accept the rooster crowing is not what my problem is. I've got guilt of failure in my life that needs to be changed. I'm going to take that off, and I'm going to put on the blood of Christ and the forgiveness of my actions. Hello. Now you got a head start. That rooster can crow every morning. You get out of the bed and say, God love that rooster. I'm going to go out and feed him. I love that rooster. He reminds me of the new man in Christ I am. It don't remind me of the old man, that, of all my failures. I used to hear that rooster and I would weep and it would run my day. Not anymore. I wear Jesus Christ every day. I put on Christ every day. I wear him. He's the answer. Do you know that, my dear people? The answer is found in the atoning blood of Christ for sin. And in the power of God's forgiveness. Don't you know that? What will wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And where does my forgiveness of that sin come from? It comes from the grace of God's forgiveness. You know that today? What kind of a Christ do you serve? What kind of a Christ do you serve? Do you... Serve that forgiving, caring, nurturing Christ. How much baggage are you carrying every time the rooster crows or every time something happens, you go back to that old place in your life? Time to get rid of that. You're carrying around a dead man. Get that corpse off you. Get that corpse off you. Listen to this. Here's Hebrews 9, 14. How much more with the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. Cleanse your what? Cleanse your what? Conscience. Cleanse your... Cleanse it from what? Guilt, shame, all that remorseful stuff. When I confess my sin and the blood of Christ has forgiven that sin and I've been forgiven that sin. 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sin, he's just... He, right? Right? To forgive and to cleanse. I should walk out. Not with that guilt anymore. That guilt. Listen. The blood of Christ has cleansed my. Listen. You have to buy into it. You've got to buy into that principle. That the blood of Christ. When I confess my sin. The blood of Christ has cleansed my guilt. My shame. 
That sin has been paid for. That sin is gone. Don't carry that dead man with you any longer. You don't need to. It's unhealthy. Quit beating yourself up. You sit around and beat yourself up, and you ought to be thankful that all that beating Christ took on the cross for you. So you won't have to walk around and beat yourself up every day. Here's another one. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our body washed by the pure water. What is that? The word of God, Ephesians 5, 26. Not only what will wash away my sin, but what will bring in the new man. What will wash my sin? The atoning work of Christ. What will bring in a new posture in my life? A new man thinking the word of God exercised by faith in my life. Did you learn anything? Eh? Well, let me tell you what you do. Don't talk it, walk it. Talk's easy. Sometimes walk. It's tough. We're going to have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. This, this meal has been paid for by the grace of God. It's already been taken care of. Your visitor just sat still. This is passed around to our people for missions and ministry. Let us pray. With our head bowed and our eyes closed, if you've never believed that Jesus died for your sins personally, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, we call that the gospel. If you never believe the gospel for your salvation, you think that somehow you have to clean up your life to be saved? Wrong. Listen, your life get cleans up the moment you accept the blood of Christ. What will wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What will cleanse and make me whole again? Let me tell you, what will make you whole again is the word of God. If you've never done that, then do it today. Today is the day of salvation for you. Believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead, give you eternal life. You need somebody to care for you? Need somebody to take care of you? You need somebody to meet every need in your life? Let me tell you who that is. That's not Santa Claus. Let me tell you, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God the Father honoring everything that Christ has provided for us so that he can deal with you in grace. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today. I pray for these at our congregation by the internet that are believers that have guilt and shame and fear and all of those things that attach to them. And the least little thing happens, their conscience uh, is alerted. They, they reflect back in the old man rather than new man. That day's got to change. That change has got to come down. They've got to understand when they confess that sin, the atoning work of Christ's blood. And they've got to put on the new man. What has Christ given me in place of all of that? For Peter, it was forgiveness. Absolute 100% forgiveness without strings attached to it. Oh, without strings attached to it. Given by the grace of God, not by works, and, but by grace. Father, this offering that we're going to take, we pray we would be good stewards of it. Spend a little on ourselves and most on, on getting people saved and on the mission field. For we bid our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.